Hi friends, my name is Benjamin, and today I want to tell you another chilling story. Sira Catherine Jewin was born in Sylvania, Ohio, on February 11, 1996, to parents Sheila Vakalik and Tom Jowin. Nicknamed C.E. by friends and family, she graduated from Evergreen High School in 2014. On July 19, 2016, a Tuesday, 20-year-old Sira Jewin spent the afternoon cycling in rural Fulton County, located west of Toledo, with her boyfriend of seven years, Josh Kolosinski. Sira, a student at the University of Toledo, resided with her grandparents in Metamora, Ohio, United States. Later that evening, when Sierra's mother, Sheila Vakulik, arrived at her parents' house, she noticed that Sierra's bedroom light was off, which was unusual. Knowing Sierra's close relationship with her family and four siblings, Sheila became concerned when she realized Sierra hadn't informed them of any plans to stay out for the night. Sheila's initial concern escalated to panic when she received a call from Josh at 10.30 p.m. Josh inquired about Sierra's whereabouts, and upon learning that she wasn't home, he informed Sheila that he had sent Sierra several text messages with no response. Additionally, all calls to Sierra's phone went directly to voicemail, indicating it was turned off or out of service. Unable to reach Sierra herself, Sheila promptly reported her daughter missing to the police and joined the search efforts. Sheila informed the police that Sierra had not returned home following the bike ride with Josh. Authorities interviewed Josh as he was the last person known to have seen Sierra. Josh recounted their outing, stating that they had gone for a bike ride along rural roads and through cornfields. He shared a Snapchat video he had taken of Sierra during the ride, showing her smiling on her purple bike. Josh explained that he was on his motorcycle, staying close to Sierra until they reached a certain point on County Road 6, where Sierra decided to continue cycling home alone. After exchanging a kiss, Josh turned back towards his own home. This interaction occurred around 6.45 p.m., and although Josh had promised to be in touch later, he received no response to the text message he sent Sierra after returning home. Police, upon viewing the Snapchat video and noticing Sierra wearing a Fitbit watch, began efforts to track her watch and phone. Simultaneously, they conducted a search of County Road 6 and the area where Josh last saw Sierra, observing signs of disturbance in a section of the cornfield with some stalks broken. As the police conducted further investigation, they located Sierra's bicycle several rows into the cornfield with blood evident on the handlebars. Remarkably, this spot was merely half a mile from her residence. Alongside her bike, they discovered Sierra's sunglasses. Additionally, they found a second pair of sunglasses, a screwdriver, and a motorcycle helmet seemingly stained with blood. Despite the presence of these items, there was no sign of Sierra. The apparent struggle indicated by the disturbance, blood, and abandoned items led authorities to suspect a possible abduction. Consequently, they broadened their search efforts and interviewed individuals residing in the vicinity. As part of their investigation, authorities spoke with James Worley, a resident of a three-acre property located west of Toledo. Worley operated a small engine repair shop from his home and resided with his mother and brother. Worley informed the police that he was familiar with the area they were searching, as his motorcycle had broken down there earlier that day. He stated that he had lost his helmet screwdriver, sunglasses, and fuses, which caused concern among the police, as these were the same items found near Sierra's sunglasses. Without being prompted, Worley asserted to the police that he hadn't stolen anything or harmed anyone. Additionally, police noticed fresh marks on his arms and bruising on his legs, further raising suspicions, prompting them to immediately secure and search his property. During the search, authorities uncovered a disturbing array of items, including rope, tape, zip ties, handcuffs, firearms, ammunition, video recording devices, and film. Inside one of Worley's barns, concealed behind tall hay bales, they encountered what was described as a makeshift dungeon. This area contained restraints attached to the walls, as well as a freezer with what appeared to be blood inside it. A strong smell of bleach permeated the area. Despite these ominous discoveries, 
there was no sign of Sierra anywhere on the property. Police continued their investigation, searching James Worley's truck, where they discovered additional incriminating items, including more zip ties, a ski mask, two sets of handcuffs, rope, and tape. Despite their suspicions that Worley may have information about Sierra's whereabouts, he remained uncooperative, posing a question to the police. How do you kidnap or take somebody on a motorcycle? Tragically, three days after Sierra was last seen alive, her body was discovered in a shallow grave buried in a cornfield, located just 12 miles from James's residence. She was found bound, gagged, and hogtied, with her wrists handcuffed and bound to her taped ankles using rope. There was no evidence indicating that Sierra had been sexually assaulted. An autopsy was conducted, confirming that Sierra's cause of death was asphyxiation. The medical examiner determined that it would have taken several minutes for Sierra to die, with the asphyxiation resulting from a large plastic object placed in her mouth. The autopsy found no evidence of sexual assault. James was arrested and faced charges of aggravated murder with an escaping detection specification, kidnapping, felonious assault, possessing criminal tools, tampering with evidence, and having weapons while under a disability. Despite the charges, he pleaded not guilty to all of them. During the prosecution's case, Fulton County Prosecutor Scott Hazelman emphasized to the jury that there could be no doubt regarding James's responsibility for Sierra's death. Hazelman asserted that evidence from cell phone location technology, DNA analysis, and recorded interviews with James would clearly demonstrate his culpability in kidnapping and killing Sierra. Hazelman urged the jury to meticulously follow the trail of evidence presented. The court learned that just one month prior to Sierra's abduction, James had used a computer at his home on June 24th at 5.03 a.m. to search for Hogtide Plus Teen. On the day Sierra went missing, James spent the day utilizing the same computer to browse pornography websites. Detective Morford testified that upon searching the computer, which was password protected, he found various search terms, videos, and documents under the user labeled Jim. Among the recovered materials were search terms and videos containing words such as rape, forced, hitchhiker, stranded, helpless, and gag. The prosecution argued that after James spent the day browsing pornography sites, he encountered Sierra cycling home by chance. Although she was a complete stranger to him, he followed her and managed to force her off the road and into the cornfield. According to their case, he pursued her into the cornfield and struck her over the head with his motorcycle helmet, potentially rendering her unconscious. Evidence presented in court revealed that Sierra's blood was found on his helmet. The prosecution contended that James then waited in the cornfield with Sierra for approximately two hours, as indicated by his cell phone location data. They alleged that he left Sierra in the cornfield and returned home on his motorcycle to retrieve his van. Afterward, James purportedly returned to the cornfield, collected Sierra, and transported her to the makeshift dungeon in the barn on his property. While the prosecution couldn't definitively state what transpired inside the barn, they argued that James hogtied and gagged Sierra, with the item used to gag her ultimately leading to her death. They suggested that James subsequently drove to a different location in a cornfield, approximately 12 miles from the barn, where he buried Sierra in a shallow grave. The evidence presented during the trial overwhelmingly implicated James in Sierra's death. Sierra's blood was discovered on James's motorcycle, and traces of her blood were also found on zip ties, mace, and a ski mask located on his property. Additionally, the prosecution informed the jury that duct tape recovered from the scene contained both James's and Sierra's DNA. Testimony revealed the existence of a dungeon on James's property, where several pairs of female panties, journals, maps, and a nanny cam were found. When questioned about the blood on his helmet, James failed to provide an explanation. He initially claimed the female panties were purchased online from China for personal use, 
but later admitted to planning amateur pornography shoots, possibly recruiting women from websites like Craigslist and Backpage. Dr. Cynthia Beiser, a Lucas County deputy coroner, testified regarding Sierra's autopsy. She described Sierra as five feet four inches tall and weighing 122 pounds at the time of her death. Dr. Beiser confirmed that Sierra's wrists and ankles were bound when her body was discovered. She detailed the injuries found on Sierra's body, including contusions on her left leg, a laceration on her forehead, a broken upper left incisor, and a hairline fracture at the back of her skull. During her testimony, Dr. Beiser described a foreign yellow object resembling a dog toy found in Sierra's mouth, which was attached to a binding around the back of her neck. This object, measuring three inches long and two inches wide, obstructed Sierra's airways, depriving her brain of oxygen for several minutes. Dr. Beiser suggested that Sierra's broken tooth may have resulted from the forcible insertion of the object into her mouth. Dr. Beiser concluded that the object led to Sierra's asphyxiation, a process that could have taken up to 10 minutes for her to die. She emphasized that Sierra was not sexually assaulted. When asked by prosecutor Fulton County Prosecutor Scott Hazelman, Dr. Beiser confirmed that the hairline fracture in Sierra's skull could have been caused by a motorcycle helmet. Defense attorney Merle Deck initiated the defense case by asserting to the jury that the prosecution failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt the essential elements of the case. He argued that based on this lack of conclusive evidence, the only appropriate verdict was to find James not guilty. The defense argued that James had no prior knowledge of Sierra and did not encounter her on July 19th. They contended that the evidence against their client was weak, acknowledging that his belongings were indeed present in the cornfield that day, but asserting that they were left there when his motorcycle broke down. They pointed to a witness report describing a man in the cornfield wearing red shorts. However, despite a thorough investigation and search of his property, no red shorts were found. The defense asserted that the police arrested the wrong individual. Regarding the makeshift dungeon discovered in James's barn, the defense provided an innocent explanation. They argued that it was not a dungeon, but merely a room with restraints attached to the wall. These restraints were intended for use in a pornography studio, as James was allegedly starting a new business venture. They suggested that James's searches for pornography on his computer were related to this business endeavor. During the trial, Lawrence Kreis testified that he knew James and resided on County Road 6. He mentioned visiting James's house approximately once or twice a month and admitted to occasionally watching pornography with James when his mother retired to bed. Lawrence further testified that James had shown him the panties and expressed a desire to establish a casting couch style pornography studio. Recorded interviews between James and the police were presented to the jury, wherein James admitted to planning amateur pornography shoots using the panties. In addressing Sierra's injuries, the defense raised questions about the source of the lacerations on both the front and back of her head. Defense attorney Mark Burling queried Dr. Beiser, asking if a motorcycle helmet was the sole object capable of inflicting such wounds. Dr. Beiser acknowledged that while a motorcycle helmet could cause such injuries, there were various other potential causes indicating that the possibilities were nearly limitless. The defense contended that James's helmet was not responsible for Sierra's injuries. Under further questioning by the defense, Dr. Beiser confirmed that there were no indications of torture on Sierra's body, supporting the defense's argument. Following six hours of deliberation, the jury found James guilty, prompting a sentencing hearing to determine whether he would face life imprisonment without parole or the death penalty. During his 45-minute statement at the sentencing hearing, James maintained his innocence, claiming he had been framed. He addressed Sierra's family, acknowledging her as a beautiful person and expressing condolences for their loss. The defense urged the court to impose a life sentence rather than the death penalty, citing James's sexual sadism associated with a fetish disorder. However, the judge rejected this plea and sentenced James to death. 
the judge emphasized to the defense that had there been any doubt regarding James's innocence, he would have opted for a life sentence instead. The revelation surfaced that Sierra's abduction was not James's first involvement in such a crime. Prior to Sierra's death, James had a conviction for abduction stemming from a separate incident. In 1990, he perpetrated a violent abduction against a woman named Robin Gardner. During this episode, James encountered Robin while she was cycling on a rural road near Toledo. Deliberately colliding with her bike using his vehicle, he caused her to tumble into a ditch. James then offered assistance, feigning concern, before assaulting her by striking her over the head and forcibly dragging her into his truck, where he proceeded to handcuff her. Inflicting injury by cutting her leg with a flathead screwdriver, he issued threats to Robin, warning her to comply or face lethal consequences. Do what I say or I'll kill you. I'm serious. I'll kill you. Following the abduction attempt on Robin Gardner, she managed to escape from James's truck and sought help from a nearby motorcyclist. Distressed and still in handcuffs, Robin was assisted by the motorcyclist who brought her home, where she later reported the incident to the authorities. James, however, denied attempting to abduct Robin, claiming instead that he was merely trying to restrain her as she attempted to flee the scene of what he described as an accident. He alleged that Robin had cut in front of him with her bike, causing the collision. Despite James's claims, he eventually pleaded guilty to the abduction charge and was sentenced to a term of four to ten years in prison. Shockingly, he was released after serving just three years behind bars. Robin suffered severe injuries, including a concussion, skull fracture, bruises and cuts as a result of the ordeal. James's execution is currently slated for May 20th, 2025. The tragic murder of Sierra spurred the enactment of Ohio Senate Bill 231, aimed at establishing a searchable database of felons convicted of specific violent offenses residing within the state. Signed into law in December 2018, this measure serves as a step towards enhancing public safety and awareness regarding individuals with violent criminal histories. What do you think of today's story? Write your opinion about this case in the comments. I thank you for your attention and recommend subscribing to the channel as well as clicking on the bell to not miss new videos that are released daily. Take care of yourself and your loved ones. See you soon.